When it comes to role-playing games, one of the best features is the ability to level up and watch as your character becomes stronger and stronger to the point where they are almost unstoppable. In my opinion, no game does this better than the original Fable, as it feels like the entire game is just designed to be a power trip given how much the player has to work with in terms of making their specific build. Because of this, however, Fable is often considered to be one of the easiest RPGs of all time. But what if we didn't have the ability to level up? Would the game still be possible to beat? Well, that's what I aim to find out, as today's the day we figure out, can you beat Fable without increasing any skills? For any of you who haven't played Fable, the experience system isn't like the Elder Scrolls or Fallout. Rather than automatically increasing skills by using them, or gaining a required amount of experience to level up and then increase a set number of stats, instead, when you gain experience in Fable, you then have to go back and spend them in a specific place. Essentially, it's like purchasing upgrades. This is actually good for me, as it means that no matter how much experience I pick up, so long as I never spend any of it, I will always remain at this game's equivalent of level 1. I would also like to bring up the fact that when I originally thought about doing a Fable video for the channel, the initial idea was for a no damage run. But it quickly became apparent that that would be far too easy, and so it shifted to this idea instead. For the fun of it, I did decide to finish that run in my own time, and even record it. So we will check in on it a few times during this run, just to see how things went. Now, with all that out of the way, let's begin. I should probably mention I'm playing the 2014 remaster for this video. Other than a shiny new coat of paint, there isn't much different with it. All the children do look more horrifying though, with their bug-like eyes. Upon starting, my first task is to get three gold pieces to buy a birthday gift for my sister. I can do this by doing good deeds, such as saving a teddy bear from the local bully, or by accepting bribes from a man cheating on his wife, and then ratting him out to his wife for double the money. We then purchase the least expensive box of chocolates in the entire world, and right as we give them to our sister Teresa, the village is attacked by bandits. Don't worry though, there is absolutely no way they can see me through this fence. We are then treated to a cutscene, and afterwards, the town is on fire, my dad is dead, and we get rescued in the nick of time by the X Factor announcer. I would like to point out that Teresa was right behind us in the field when the bandits attacked, so I have no idea how she got kidnapped and we didn't. Not that it matters at the end of the day, as we get drafted into the Heroes Guild, meet one of the worst roommates ever, and then get given our first weapon in the form of a stick, which we use to beat the training dummy to death. The fact that the dummy drops an experience orb when it's destroyed implies that it had some type of knowledge, meaning it was indeed alive. Oh. Think about that the next time you try the archery competition. It's at this point we get our first real taste of combat as I head into the guild woods and begin using the stick, meaning I just get to ungabunga these beetles to death like the caveman that I am. After I get paid for playing Exterminator, I skip forward a few years and we get to see how much Whisper enjoys being stabbed repeatedly during training. We also get introduced to her brother, Thunder. All you need to know about him is that throughout the course of this game, we are going to ruin his entire life. All that's left of this segment is torturing a few more practice dummies with archery and lightning before advancing to the final stage of the tutorial, which is literally the exact same thing, except now it's me as who's on the receiving end of the punishment. Clearly, my attacks do some lasting damage, as he seems to be a little out of it during my graduation ceremony. With that, the tutorial's finished, and what better way to celebrate my newfound freedom than by going to the nearby picnic area and slaughtering all of the wildlife that is present. Seeing how the game expects you to not really have any skills yet, the fight with the wasps and their queen goes about as smooth as it possibly can. With the first quest complete, I head off to the nearby town of Barstone, where I meet back up with Maze, and he scolds me and tells me to replace my basic equipment while I'm here. Seeing how I can't level up, this means my only means of standing a chance is by buying the best weapons and armor that I can afford. Now, the game probably expects you to buy a new steel sword or a better ranged weapon. However, if you've seen any of my New Vegas videos, then you know I fancy myself a bit of gambling. And, it just so happens there's a card matching game in the tavern that I'm relatively good at. Long story short, I play this card game for about 40 minutes straight until I have enough gold to buy a full set of plate mail along with a master axe. If anyone is morbidly curious, there will be a link in the description to a video showing me playing the card game just to prove I didn't cheat to get the money, as we all know there's a lot of money exploits and glitches in this game. Seeing how I've just gotten a substantial upgrade, let's see how the no damage run is going. Ah, back to the main playthrough and we're planning to steal some boxes from a nearby farm. Also yes, I'm going to be evil. Why? Simply because it's a lot more fun to be evil than it is to be good in the original Fable. As I have one of the weapons that you are not meant to get until later in the game, I managed to take down every single guard in just two swings, which leaves just good old Whisper. It was very bold and stupid of her to let me have the first swing, as that just led straight into a 5 hit combo that instantly ended the fight. Sadly, we aren't allowed to kill her just yet. That comes later. 
Seeing how experience is worthless to me, I don't see the point in doing any side quests, so I begin heading towards Darkwood for the next main quest. The journey through Greatwood to get there has me cleaving my way through many a bandit, as well as fighting my way through a makeshift tollgate and camp that they set up along the way. Best of all, I find a flame augmentation in one of their chests, so that's some fire damage on top of the axe as well. When I meet up with the two traders that I have to escort, we get stopped almost immediately by a third one who's been attacked and left for dead by a Balverine. Don't know what that is, it's a glorified werewolf. So, rather than run the risk of having my innards become outards and the added bonus of badman points, I tell the were trader to beat it and continue on with the two non-flesh eating ones. Speaking of Balverines, in the next segment of the woods I get to fight my first one. As I'm still at the beginning of the game and have the best armour money can buy, their attacks don't phase me all that much and I can chip away at them with my axe. That said, even with a master axe it takes a fair few swings to put the beast down. I forgot just how little your attacks do on them if you don't have a silver augmentation, so it may be worthwhile to pick one of those up later. When we make it to the Darkwood camp I check to see if one of the merchants had a better master weapon for sale. He only had a master great axe, which sadly I can't use as I obviously can't get my physique high enough to wield it efficiently. Not much to say about the rest of the journey though, we know at this point I still pretty much two shot any and all bandits, and as for the troll mini boss at the end? Well, I just hack away at his stomach for a bit before resorting to knocking his boulders back at him for maximum damage. Once he's out of the picture, we make it to Barrow Fields and the traders are safe and I get my reward. The more experienced Fable players among you are probably wondering why I didn't sacrifice one of them to the Chapel of Scorm and get Scorm's bow. Well, truth is, I forgot. Not a great reason, but honestly, it's the truth. Guess what though, we're now back in Oakville. You know, the town that burned around us as everyone we ever knew and loved died. Judging by the fact that the hero looks like he's trying to blow up this girl with the power of his mind, I don't think he's taking this sudden PTSD flashback very well. While on the topic of our childhood home's destruction, we meet up with good old Maze. He then tells us that we can go and face the man responsible, an ex-hero named Twinblade. Hmm, wonder what kind of weapons he'll have. Well, on the way there, we get introduced to another new mechanic of this game, stealth. It's so important and crucial to the series that this is the one and only time it'll ever be used. It's not even stealthy, you just look like someone trying to walk with really bad posture. At the end of the day, this segment is fairly short and simple as the guards all suffer from Metal Gear Tunnel Vision, so it doesn't take much to sneak on by. After that gameplay segment, it's back to more bandit slaughtering as they all patiently wait their turn as I hack them to pieces. I also have to collect a bandit disguise to get into the camp because Twinblade's paranoid about who comes and goes lately. You'd think this would be when the game utilises that stealth feature we just learned, but you'd be wrong. Well, turns out this is only how you gain access to the first portion of Twinblade's camp. To get to the second area, we have a few choices. I can either win it off this game master by playing a memory game, or I can buy one off of one of the bandits. Or, my personal favourite, option 3, in which I just kill the game master and take the pass that way. Once again, the pass only gets us so far, as now we need to get past a second gate to meet the man himself. I thought I could just kill the guard at the door and maybe get a key to open the gate, but that's not an option this time I'm afraid. This means I can either kill every single bandit until they send reinforcements and therefore have to open the gate, pay these edgy looking guys to cause a distraction, or I can release the hostages. While I said I'm doing an evil playthrough, I also don't like wasting resources fighting all the bandits, and I'm certainly not giving away any potential gambling money. So I opt to kill the slave master and release the slaves as a distraction. Like I said, this is the good option, but the speed in which these bandits are approaching these women does not bode well for them. Ah well, you win some, you lose some, I'm off to fight Twinblade. The Twinblade fight is probably one of the most early 2000s video game style boss fights I can think of. What I mean by this is he has a very obvious weak spot on his back as he has no armour there, but before you can get a chance to hit it, he does a few normal sword swings and then does a very long telegraphed sword slam to the ground that leaves him wide open for you to attack. This means I just roll around him like I'm fighting a Dark Souls boss and just take my pot shots where I can. This does take longer than usual due to my weak noodle arms, but I do manage to whittle him down to the point where the fight stops as we're interrupted by my now blind sister. Clearly her terrifying bug eyes creeped out somebody else too. We have a nice chat and then she empowers me with experience that I can't use and then I'm left with the choice of whether to kill or spare Twinblade. Well, I am evil, so before I bring the axe down on his head, I go around and take out the bandit mosh pit so they don't all jump into his rescue when I attack him. It's not like a second phase of the fight or anything, it's just continuing on from where you left off before Teresa stopped you, so it's just more of the same. I did manage to glitch the game out as I didn't do enough damage to kill him, but as you can see his health bar is empty and I can't lock onto him. Thankfully though, I just wait for him to go through one more attack cycle and one last hit finishes him off. I then celebrate my victory in the absolute best way possible.
With Twinblade disrespected to Helmbach, I return to the guild to get my next quest from Maze, in which he tasks me with finding a friend of his known only as the Archaeologist. This has me travelling to Witchwood near Nothoglade, which, if Albion is meant to be England, would mean that this is probably Northern Ireland, so in other words... Upon arriving, I am almost instantly greeted by a rock troll, and I get ready to fight it, when I realise that unlike the last troll, there is nothing stopping me from just running to the next area and ignoring him. So, after taking one rock to the back of my skull, I do just that. It's in the next area that I find the demon door that's hiding the archaeologist. Now, the door won't budge unless I know his name and then decide to spell out for him on some large nearby rocks. What you are meant to do is head to the nearby temple and find the person there and learn it that way. However, I have played this game many, many times before, so I can just head up to the stones, spell out the name Hits, and then walk right through the door and complete the quest. Well, that was quick and easy. Maybe we should check back in and see how the no damage runs going. S H I D S H I D Ah. I'm now at the part of the game where they start to throw tougher enemies at you, so I feel it's time for an upgrade. Meaning, it's time to go believe in the heart of the cards once again. The problem is, once I get the money, the weapon I want isn't being sold by any of the traders I can access, so the only option is going to North Hulk Glade where my next main mission is, and then helping them to gain access to another blacksmith. Once I arrive at the town, it's under attack by Balverines, and guess who didn't buy that silver augment he was talking about earlier. They hit pretty hard at this point, especially with my starting game health, but so long as they only fight me one at a time, then things are okay. Once I clear out the small fries, the big cheese of the Balverines appears. You can tell he's going to be stronger because he's a different colour than all the others. The first phase of the fight just has me hit him a few times across the entire village until the wife of the last Balverine hunter tells us that the white one is in fact her husband and that he needs to be put down. To help me do this, she gives me a silver augment that will allow me to do extra damage to it. So I immediately wedge it into my axe and then continue to slap the Balverine around for a bit before it retreats from the town. Just like with the Balverines outside the village, he's simple enough to take down on his own. All you need to do is block his initial attack and then you can unleash a flurry of your own hits on him. It's when you drain a certain amount of his health however that he begins to call in his posse and that's when things tend to get a bit more difficult to manage. The smart play here is to take out each of the smaller ones as I enter the fight so you don't get overwhelmed, but I'm far too impatient for that one so I just hard focus on the big one as the quest is complete once the white one's dead so the others don't really matter. Despite how dire the situation looks, I actually am able to deal with the White Balverine rather quickly, and as soon as he goes down, I sprint my way back to North Glade to hand in the quest. As soon as I do, I'm invited to fight in the arena. Now, seeing how my biggest weakness is being ganged up on by large groups of enemies, this is probably going to be pretty rough. Thankfully now that I helped out the village, I can trade with the blacksmith, so I sell him my axe for more money, then I use it to buy a sharpening augment and the best single-handed weapon money can buy right now, a Master Katana. That's right, I now study the blade. Before heading to the arena, I stock up on as many healing supplies as I can, as I'm pretty much at the point where everything is now two-shotting me. When we enter the arena, we aren't actually the first person to go out to fight, which is wonderful as it allows me to use the trader here and get another two sharpening augments for my katana. So, with all three of them, it now does 194 damage. This is basically as ready as I can be, as I already have the best armor protection-wise, so here goes nothing. Oh, I should also mention I changed my name before entering the arena. I thought I should be called something better than Chicken Chaser for my grand entrance into the arena. For your entertainment, I give you Arsface. I'll go through each round of the arena so you get an idea of how things are starting to go by this point in the story. Round 1 is literally just wasps. You know, the enemies that you can one-shot as soon as you leave the tutorial, so they go by without a hitch. The second round is hobs, basically just children turned goblins. Obviously, they're tougher than the wasps, but what isn't? The only annoyance of this fight is the ones that cast magic at you as they can be surprisingly accurate with those blasts. I thought I'd have some trouble with the bigger ones that wield the hammers, but they aren't very fast so I just picked them off one at a time with my bow and before I knew it, I was on to the third round. This round is pretty bad for two reasons. First off, it's a whole pack of Balverines, which is never good, and secondly, Whisper decides to join us for the rest of the arena. Well, she's not all that bad here. At the very least, she acts as a good distraction so I don't get my limbs chewed off immediately. The real struggle here comes from the fact that I sold my axe. While yes, it was a lot weaker than my katana, it also had that silver augment in it, meaning it would have chopped through this round in a few minutes. Things don't really get bad until the white balverines begin to spawn. Without the silver augment, they take so little damage and it just becomes a slog to take down even one of them. They actually get the better of me and I go down. Thankfully, I'm carrying some resurrection vials, which basically act like extra lives, so long as I don't burn through all of them, I should be fine. 
What you're seeing right now is a sped up version of me fighting a white Balvarine from full health. As you can see, they take a lot of punishment before they finally go down. And keep in mind, I had to fight three of these things in this round. Needless to say, by the time the last one was dead, I had burned through a considerable amount of my healing supplies along with another two revives. Thankfully though, this was just a difficulty spike as the next two rounds are very easy. Round 4 is our first ever encounter with the undead. They are very slow and easy to dodge, so all you really need to do is roll behind them and then you can just let loose with a weapon until they die. You could also just stand back and snipe them with your bow as they are far too slow to ever catch you now that I think about it. Speaking of which, that's exactly what I do in the next round as it's just your run of the mill bandits. Not much to say here, you've seen me slaughter countless of them by this point in the story, so let's just move on to the round 6. Now the game decides to throw a curveball at you by pitting you against two earth trolls. I expected this to be a lot more difficult given my low health, but I was able to get one of them stuck in a loop that allowed me to just hack away at him until he died, and all the while the other troll just didn't seem to acknowledge me. I'm guessing that Whisper actually worked as a distraction for once. Works for me however, as then I easily do the same thing to the second troll and we are already finished with this round. The next round is the same thing, except with rock trolls. Except pretty much everything went the exact opposite of the last fight, as neither one of them aggroed on Whisper, and I essentially just got to eat shit for most of the fight for lack of a better way to put it. When I finally managed to take out one of them, the other got stuck in this weird position where he would throw a rock at me and then immediately focus on Whisper and prepare to do a ground slam, but then I would hit him with my arrow and it would just reset the animation, and then this just repeated until he died. Now into the final round and it's an entirely unique enemy in the form of an absolutely massive scorpion. Now, while he looks intimidating, it is actually one of the most simple and boring fights in the game. All you have to do is literally stand back and pelt him with arrows. That's it. His attacks are all highly telegraphed and so slow that it's rare he hits you and it gives you ample time to get multiple shots off, especially when he's doing his long charge up stinger slam move. So a few hundred hours later and the arena is complete. Except not quite, as the clearly not main villain of the game shows up and demands that me and Whisper fight to the death. Now, Whisper does not want me to go through with this as she thinks we are friends, but from what I recall, she has not ever once been nice to me, so... To be fair, I don't kill her just to be evil, I also get a 10,000 gold bonus. This is also where we meet up with Thunder again from the start of the game, along with his supposed future wife, the Mayor of Barstone, Lady Grey. Remember how I mentioned earlier we're going to make his life a living hell? Well, that process starts now. As if losing his sister wasn't bad enough, I'm also going to steal his bride-to-be because I'm just a nice guy like that. This involves me doing a bunch of pointless tasks for the Mayor, such as learning about her, getting her gifts, and finding the necklace of the sister she murdered so she can keep it for herself. You know, the usual. This all culminates in a duel with Thunder to see who is the most worthy of the simps. Why did I write that? <laughs> Being the conniving trickster that I am, I decide to bring back up to the fight. Meet Joel. Well, turns out I may have forgotten the fact that you can't actually hit Thunder with melee attacks half the time, as this lightning AoE movie does, makes it so you take damage if you hit him. So Joel gets bodied almost instantly and it's back down to a semi-fair fight. Lucky for me, I used the money I got from killing his sister to buy myself a master bow, so I just dodge around him and take shots at him whenever I see an opening. What I found to be the winning strat was to shoot him with an arrow which would cause him to do this odd spinning sword strike, which I would then roll past and shoot him in the back, and then he would try to do his lightning move and then I'd just shoot him again. This would then reset his pattern and this continued until the fight was finished. We don't get to kill him yet, that comes later. We have to give him time to really sulk over his defeat. I then went back and married Lady Grey, which gives me access to Barstone Manor. I had thought about going to find 15 silver keys to open the chest here, as the weapon inside is the best single handed weapon you can get until near the end of the game, but I decided against it in the end, because it could take quite a while to get that many keys, as I'd probably need to run back through 90% of the areas I'd already been to just to get enough. With that in mind, and no more distractions, it was back to the main quest, and wouldn't you know it, we have to rescue the archaeologist again. This time though, the rescue is quite a bit more difficult as now we have to deal with some of the hardest enemies in the game, Jack's minions. Yes, they are literally called minions. Do with that what you will. Like most enemies in Fable 1, if you manage to get behind them, you can usually get them stuck in an infinite and deal with them rather easily. But let's also keep in mind that they are pretty much able to one or two shot me given the chance, as the game kind of expects you to have more than a crumb of health or toughness by this point. 
The first encounter with them you can just run past, which is good, but once you reach the windmill you need to kill the magical ones with the funny staffs, otherwise you're stuck behind this magical barrier. When I make it to the end where they're taking the archaeologist, I initially thought that this was going to be the end of the run, as you have a time limit to get rid of all the minions and save them. On my first attempt, I tried using my bow to take out the minions, as I felt that there was just too many of them to reliably get melee attacks off without getting knocked down every few seconds. While the bow was getting results, it was also taking far too long and it quickly became apparent that I wouldn't have enough time to kill them all. So I loaded back and thought of a better idea. I ran past all the minions on the way down to the pier and began focusing on the two that were waiting for me there. This meant that the others would follow me down and I could fight them here where it was much more open. It wasn't exactly a foolproof strategy as I took many hits and had to use a good few revives, but I was able to destroy the minions before the time ran out. Once we complete the rescue, we are informed that we need to get to Jack's secret prison, but to get there, we need to head through the graveyard. At the graveyard, and once again, our hero clearly demonstrates why he has absolutely no concept of the word stealth, as he not so subtly listens in on this conversation about pieces of armour we need to recover to unlock a secret path to the prison. The first piece we take from this man's house right before we take his life, as well as the key to the graveyard to find the other pieces. This is also where we encounter more undead, just like in the arena, the only difference is they respawn indefinitely here. With that in mind, as well as the fact I don't need anything they may drop, I just roll my way through the graveyard, only stopping to rob graves and fish for the armour I need. Once we return the armour to its rightful skeleton, we gain access to the hidden path and once again I channel my inner limp biscuit and roll all the way to the entrance to the prison. There's also this place where I have to kill a bunch of undead in some summoning circle to open the door. It's not a big deal as they're all just as brittle as ever. Making my way into the prison to find Mother Dearest and I rescue her in record time and then immediately leave her to fend for herself as I make my way past all the guards and come face to face with Jack once again. Despite the fact I have shown how formidable I am by this point in the game, I am somehow captured by Jack and just a handful of minions. In the prison, we don't get to look at our malnourished munchkin for long before we're pitted in a race against the other prisoners. Naturally, we win, and we get to go to the warden's office and listen to him spout poetry about Lady Grey. While he does this, I need to steal a combination from a board next to him, and then try and steal a key to the cells from one of his diaries. Why do I not just snap his neck while I'm here and open all three books? Couldn't tell you. Not that it matters, as you will always fail to get the key on your first attempt, and as such, have to wait another in-game year, compete in the race again, and then successfully steal it the following year. When I do get the key, I do one of the only morally right choices of this run and let the other prisoners free. I say morally right, because while it does give me good boy points, I am literally only doing this so they distract the guards long enough for me to get my gear and attempt rescue number two for mum. As the guards won't attack her, I just once again leave her behind as I sprint for the exit, but not before surprise Kraken. Now, he doesn't come completely out of nowhere. See, when you enter here on your first prison break attempt, you can briefly see him before he instantly zips under the water. Pretty sure this is a glitch, but it happens every time I play the game, so who knows. Don't worry though, he goes down pretty easy to repeated arrows to the skull. Are you beginning to see a pattern here for every boss that isn't Twinblade? With seafood for dinner, we escape the prison, my mother goes cross-eyed for a bit, she blasts me with experience I'll never use, and then I finally finish this quest and move on to what would have been the last section of the game. But the remaster has the Lost Chapters content by default, so rather than 40 minutes of playtime, there's about another 2-3 to three hours. You aren't a fantasy RPG if you don't have a snowy area somewhere in your game, so let's go to one now. According to our mother, we need to head back to the spooky forest where we escorted those traders at the beginning of the game and start up one of the old teleporters there. Problem is, it can only be charged up by souls. A bit morbid, but we can make it work. Conveniently, it's not like a sacrifice or anything. No, instead we just have to re-undead a bunch of zombies. The issue in this lies in the fact that the soul meter, or whatever, drains over time. And we take a few seconds to kill even the smallest undead at this point. That means what would normally be a 30 second or so portion of this quest takes me a few minutes as I need to strategically lower the health of a few of them so that I can pick them off back to back to fill up the meter quick enough. Sure enough, it works and we get teleported to good old Snowy Town. We are meant to be looking for a key to a special sword that can be found in the graveyard, but of course when we get there it's sealed off and we can't get in. I then go right back to the guild and my mother is recaptured by Jack. For anyone paying attention, yes, we literally rescued her a single mission ago and she is already kidnapped again. Thankfully, Mustache can translate the language of an old tome that our mother was reading that will get rid of the barrier. And when he does, we get hit with the big twist that Maze is actually working for Jack. So Jack gets the key, and now it's time to fight Maze. Usually, this is a relatively easy battle, but not this time. Just about any single one of Maze's spells will kill me instantly. This means that with my current supply of resurrection vials, I can only really afford to get hit seven times before he kills me outright. Getting Maze down to low health is fairly straightforward, as it's just a matter of getting a few swings in at his back and then knowing when to back off before he does an AoE attack. It's when he enters the lighthouse it becomes a completely different beast. 
Not only can he apparently hit me while being a full floor above me, but he also just camps out on the stairs and waits for me to get within range and uses his inflame spell which instantly kills me, not to mention it seems to have a deceptively large hitbox. Whenever he did follow me down the stairs, I thought it was all over as he hit me with another inflame and my health dropped to zero with no revives left. Turns out though if you're fast enough in certain situations you can quickly swig a health potion and essentially tank the hit. This is probably going to be a pretty valuable trick going forward. With a new lease on life, I lure Maze outside and try to keep him at a medium distance so he shoots fireballs at me as he's left vulnerable to ranged attacks when he does this. After a few shots, I just about claim victory and now it's time to stop Jack. Before that though, I begin heading around all the shops and buying any and all healing potions and resurrection vials that I can. I also go and hire two bodyguards to act as distractions in the fight with Jack as I know from experience he will summon his minions during the fight. The first part of this mission is just you and a few of the other heroes you've met running around trying to find Jack and always being just too late until he goes to the guild and waits for you in the Chamber of Fate. By the way, that's the room with the no damage run got that super powered sword from earlier. In fact, let's check in and see how that playthrough is going. Ah, when we make it to Jack he kills our mother, which, you know, that's kind of sad, but we only really got to talk to her for like two minutes, so can't be too upset. The first phase of the fight has me and my bodyguards facing off against a group of Jack's minions. The bodyguards actually do a better job than I thought, keeping the minions busy while I take out a few of my bow. By this point, the katana has pretty much been retired as it's just not doing much anymore. Once we finish off the last of them, Jack enters the fight and wipes out the bodyguards in seconds. My tactics for this part of the fight are fairly similar to the maze fight. Getting close to him in my current predicament is a death sentence, so I need to stay back and wait for certain moves like this one where he shoots out a bunch of orbs, or when he fires a shockwave from the Sword of Aeons. As like Maze's fireballs, he is able to be punished when using these attacks. We trade blows for a bit, but eventually I'm able to reduce him to half health and the third and final phase of the fight begins. Jack grows up and becomes a big boy and these spiky rocks come out of the ground. It is now an entirely ranged battle in this phase, so while he has more opportunities to hit me, I also have far more opportunities to hit him, and he no longer seems to deflect any of your ranged attacks. The only attack of his I have to watch out for is this one where he lifts the sword up into the air, and unless you're standing behind one of the new conveniently placed rocks, it seems to drain your health bar instantly. I'm bringing this up because this is the first time I've ever seen him do this move. I can't be the only one who usually ends this fight in less than 30 seconds with multi arrows before he can do anything. This isn't a big deal though, it doesn't take long till my basic level 1 archery skilled arrows take him down anyway. Archery is overpowered in every game it is in and I will not be convinced otherwise. With Jack out of the picture for like 5 minutes, Teresa then tells me that I now have to choose whether I want to cast the Sword of Aeons into the void, or if I want to kill her with it to power it up and keep it and be as powerful as Jack. No clue why I can't just let her live and just keep the sword as it's pretty powerful as is, so I do the right thing. While that was clearly supposed to be the ending of the game, the great Peter Molyneux thought that clearly murdering my sister wasn't evil enough, so now we have an epilogue chapter of sorts where we can truly become the baddest of the bad. Firstly, we need to enter a new special demon door that's only just appeared, which contains these five frozen prophets, but more importantly, an item called the Fireheart which will summon a ship that can take us to the DLC land. To get the Fireheart we need to do these five simple puzzles where we need to either make all of the panels moons or suns. Making them all suns will free those prophets I mentioned, but making them moons will cause them all to explode, so you already know what I'm about to do. Spare my brothers! Oh! With the fire heart in hand, I hire two more bodyguards and head for Hook Coast to summon the ship and we get attacked by a new type of enemy called Summoners. Short and to the point, they are the worst. They have a lot of health, they hit hard, and they have a powerful ranged attack that functions just like Thunder's lightning move, meaning you can't hit them with a melee attack or you'll hurt yourself and look like an idiot. After we take out the first one, another few spawn in the village along with a bunch of Jack's minions and they begin attacking the fire heart, effectively turning this into another time based mission. Thank God I have the Sword of Aeons as I don't think this fight would have been possible without it. I was somehow able to get this on my first attempt by the absolute skin of my teeth, just one more shot from one of the summoners and it would have been game over. At the very least when you take out the last summoner all of the minions just explode so at least I don't have to waste time dealing with them. With 10 years off of my life due to stress I board the boat and sail for the Lost Bay and Snowspire Village. Once I arrive, I am almost instantly assaulted by a frost troll, which is really just a reskinned rock troll that occasionally causes icicles to stab your toes. That means I deal with him quickly and then avoid any and all enemies on my way to the main quest. Basically, we get to the village and meet up with this scariest looking good guy named Scythe and he tells us that we need to head to the nearby graveyard called the Necropolis and find the four glyphs that will allow us to communicate with something called the Oracle and we will learn what to do next. The graveyard is filled with bone men and snowy balverines, but they aren't too hard to deal with and besides, I know where the glyphs are so I don't need to overstay my welcome here. Well, I say that, but the fight at the end to retrieve the last glyph has me fight two summoners and some minions in a very boxed in arena. You wouldn't think it, but this was probably one of, if not the most annoying fight in the game. 
It just felt that every time I tried to get up I would get knocked down again by one of the summoner's magic attacks. Not helping matters is the fact that since the summoners weren't attacking at the same time, as soon as one of them hit me, I only had a few seconds to recover and get a shot off with my bow before one of them would probably knock me down with his magic. As soon as one of them went down however, the fight got exponentially easier. And before long, I got the last glyph and returned to the oracle. Would you like to see how you communicate with the oracle? Keep in mind this isn't a joke, I am being dead serious here. All of that for a reference. Well from the village people we learn two things, one that Jack isn't dead and two that he is beyond something called the bronze gate and the only way to get it open is to feed its specific souls. You can probably see where this is going. Briar Rose, a character I've neglected to mention until now because she's barely even a character, tells me that the first soul needed is that of an arena champion. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Suicide is badass! But no, we are instead going to find Thunder and put the final nail in his coffin. Almost literally. Seeing how this is almost the exact same as the fight from earlier with him, the same strategy from then also works, so I just did that again and after a few minutes he goes down and it's on to the next soul. Next up for the soul platter is the soul of a heroine. Now you all understand why Briar Rose here exists in the game. Credit where credit is due, she put up a much better fight than Thunder at least. The main issue is when she summons all of her clones I don't output enough damage to get rid of them all before she then jumps in and uses her lifesteal move. The power of my bow is somehow able to triumph over her magic however and I also somehow managed to get the same glitches earlier with Twinblade where it wouldn't let me target her. Odd. With Briar Rose gone you would think that would be me completely screwed as she was deciphering the runes here to find out whose soul I would need next. But nice guy Jack of all people decides to chime in and lets me know that the final requirement is that of an old soul and that the guildmaster is the perfect fit. The fact that he is helping me all of a sudden should really be setting off a bunch of red flags, but apparently not as I head straight for the guild woods and see about shaving that moustache once and for all. You don't actually fight the guildmaster sadly, rather he plays support by buffing and healing a bunch of nearby guards and all you have to do is take them all out. I thought that maybe this would be fairly challenging as I wasn't really sure how tough the guards would be, but as it turns out they're about equal to that of bandits, so in other words this is a cakewalk. When the battle is over we get to watch as we one shot the guildmaster in a cutscene and then it's time to head to the bronze gate and finally finish this run. As we enter through the bronze gate we find that Jack is now a dragon because reasons and the final fight begins. I don't mean to make this fight seem underwhelming but dragon Jack doesn't have a lot going for him other than a lot of health. Sure he can one shot me but let's be honest, at this point who can't? The fight just boils down to me hitting him repeatedly in the face with the sword of aeons while he pretty much stands there and takes it and maybe occasionally tries to bite me. Then once he's had enough of being sliced he'll fly around the arena for a bit and breathe fire down on you. This attack is pretty simple to dodge as you can clearly see him coming on the minimap so it's just a matter of moving away from where the red dot's flying. He will summon both minions and summoners to help out in the fight which could have made things a lot more challenging but it turns out that he can also hurt them so more often than not he'll just obliterate them with his fire breath and then it's back to just me stabbing him. I repeat this for about 3 minutes until his health bar is depleted and Jack is finally defeated. Now there is just one last choice to make, do I be good and cast the mask into the fire like it's Lord of the Rings or do I be evil and keep it for myself and get possessed by Jack. I said I was doing an evil run at the start of this playthrough but I also ain't stupid so I yeet that porcelain prick straight into the volcano, ending the game and proving yes you can indeed beat Fable without increasing any skills. That was a bit of a longer one than usual. <laughs> I've been wanting to make a fable video for a while now so I really hope you all enjoyed it. As for the new damage run that I did alongside this one just for the hell of it, I may release a shorter bonus video at some point, it's just there wasn't really a whole lot to talk about as once you get the physical shield spell nothing can really hurt you if you keep your magic topped up. Regardless that's going to be the end of this challenge video, if you enjoyed what you saw consider giving the video a like and if you're interested in more challenges in the future feel free to subscribe to try to have one of these videos out every week. My name's Norbert, stay safe everyone, I'll see you all in the next video.